Hello everybody and welcome back to another video on the channel Just whatever today we will look at how Mark Esserman destroyed Super Grandmaster Luke Wan Whaley in a classical game. But how did that happen? Well, the big difference between an international master and a super GM is that the international master usually has more in his life than just chess. The super GM doesn't. I've ever gotten head and been thinking about chess positions at the same time. Oh, that one is a definite yes. Naturally, the Super GM most of the time wins with ease against the International Master. That's also why their ego is more bloated than I am after I ordered extra beans at Taco Bell. Can you order extra beans at Taco Bell? I'm not an American, I've never been to a Taco Bell. But Mark Esserman isn't just some random international master. He actually is the world's leading authority on the Smith Mora Gambit. The Smith Mora Gambit gets played against the Sicilian. You sacrifice a pawn early on in exchange for quick development and a possible very strong attack. While this is a good opening, and my personal recommendation for any beginner or intermediate player that wants to learn an opening against the Sicilian, it does not get played a lot in the top top level just because there are other openings that have a better winning chance with white. Now if you know that you're better at chess than someone else, but this other guy has one opening that he knows better than any other human being in the world, you probably don't want to play exactly that opening against him. But remember what I said about the egos of super gems. So After Mark started with e4, when Whaley decided to play c5, the Sicilian defense. Of course, we get d4, takes, c3, takes, and knight takes. The Smith Mora Gambit. So now we are in Mark Esserman's territory. We have this knight coming out, and it is very important to remember that if you play with black against the Smith Mora Gambit, you don't want to play e5 because you just enter very complicated lines where white gets a very good attack and it's just super difficult to defend. So here you want to play e6 and after white plays out you want to play a6 to gain control over the white squares. Remember that. We have castles, the knight's coming out and white pins this knight. This knight usually wants to go to g6. Uh, right now you can because you're pinned there are multiple ways to achieve this. You can play h6 and after the bishop drops back even g5 and get it to g6. This is considered pretty equal. Uh, the other way would be, which is not as good but is still a way to play, the queen to c7 because then the pin is also gone and you can play the knight to g6. When Whaley decided for the main line, which I don't really like and you need to let the computer run for quite some time before it even comes up with this move, which is f6. And this just breaks the iron rule. Never play f6. Remember that. Never play f6. It's just strategically way too weakening. After f6, the bishop drops back, and we get the knight to g6, as said before. This bishop goes back so that b5 does not come with a tempo. When Whaley plays b5 anyway, which is fine, and we have knight to d5? What's going on here? <laughs> the position was pretty calm, and now knight to d5 is just coming out of the blue, out of nowhere, like a left side tackle at football, and... God, I hope I used this analogy right. I don't even watch football. Is left side tackle even a thing? I bet you can order extra beans at Taco Bell. Anyways, if your opponent just offers you a piece for free, you usually should take it. Like, I'm the kind of guy that says, well, if your opponent sacrifices and you don't take it, you're probably worse. And if you take it, you're maybe also worse, but at least you get an interesting game. That's why I also always take every gambit. <laughs> yes, it might not be the smartest move in, in terms of winning chances, but at least you get a fun game. So when Whaley took it, when Whaley probably didn't took it to, to get a fun game, but because it's actually the best move to do here. And we have pawn takes. The knight has to move. And we already start to see the reason of the sacrifice and why f6 was bad. Because this pawn dominates the black position. And this bishop is insanely strong now. I mean, if this pawn would be back here where it belongs, then it wouldn't be as bad. It would still be difficult to develop and get castled, but at least you could. Here, you can never get castled. I mean, if, if you move here, maybe, wait, that just loses a piece. If you move the 
knight somewhere where it's safe, you could play g6 and get the bishop out, but then you still couldn't castle. And even if you could, even if the bishop moves, do you really want to castle into this pawn structure or even with the pawn out? No, you don't want to. On the other hand, you also can't castle queenside because, I mean, what's that? That's no shelter at all for the king. You can't as well just leave the king in the middle, which happens. I mean, black has no other choice than to leave the king in the middle. This is usually bad, especially if your opponent's king is just snuggled in the back of the corner. Like, this king is as safe as it gets. So black develops a bishop, which is fine, and we have takes, takes, and f4. White realizes something, and I talk a bit about this quite a lot when we have the, those f4 pushes um, after the king castled. As a beginner, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't push pawns in front of your king. The reason why it is good here is that first of all, yes, this diagonal is weak now, but you have reinforcement with this bishop. The black bishop can't really get to this diagonal anytime soon, so the only piece that would be dangerous on this diagonal is the queen, and here you have the defense of the bishop, so this is fine now. Mark Esserman realized that black is underdeveloped, and you can't get this king out of the center, so you want to blow up the center. This king is still safe. Of course, black doesn't take, but plays the queen to f6. We have takes and takes. And I mean, this king is just open. The bishop goes to g5, which is another sacrifice by Esserman. First of all, it threatens to simply win the queen. But also, if you take this, I play this check. The king has to move. Now here, the bishop sacrifices itself. When the king moves, there is this checkmate in two. We have check, here, and mate. And if the king tries to run to the other side, we have this check, which is also checkmate. So here, the bishop would have to sacrifice itself for the greater good, but this check is, check is still coming. You can't really go here, because then I take the knight with check again, and uh, this is still hanging. This is just a world of pain. You have this perpetual check, not perpetual check, but a windmill attack where you always move and I come again and I just pick up all of your pieces and, and go here. And eventually uh, you have to move to this side and then it's the same maiden two again. So you really can't take the sacrifice. And of course, Von Wally saw this and sacrificed the bishop preemptively yeah, for the greater good. Um, we first give this check, the king has to move out of the way, and now Esserman takes the bishop with a check. Uh, we have knight takes, and uh, the, king, the queen moves up, again enabling this check, saving the bishop, and connecting the rooks. Because now, after the king tries to run away, white gives this check. The knight moves in between, the rook activates itself even further, the queen scooches away, and we have this bishop coming to f4. And now it's not looking good. Because, yes! The queen can take the bishop, which is just hanging there for free, but queen to d6. And it's not that easy to stop that checkmate. Black finds a way by running away with the king, but uh, we have takes. And bishop takes, queen takes, you can't take back because this is pinned. And this is where black resigned. Because it's pretty difficult to defend this rook. And also this rook. Like, if you just uh, move up here, for example, I play check, the king has to move, and this is checkmate. If you try to go here, I win your rook anyways, just for free, completely for free. And if you try to go here, I play this check first, the king has to move, then I take this rook, and then it's mate, but even if it wouldn't be mate, I would still win the other rook. So white just wins everything here, with checkmate to follow. That's why Black resigned. In just 26 move, a super grandmaster resigned against an international master. Now, I'm not a betting man, but I would guess that Luke Van Whaley never again played the Smith-Morrow Gambit against Mark Esserman.